this thing at that you made from home? Maybe at this I'll... point, I'm going to have to ask you guys to leave. I'm in D.C. this week for CPAC. If you saw my video from last year, you saw me getting thrown out. To my surprise, this year, when I applied for a press pass, they approved me. So uh, we're going to see how this goes. I expect to get thrown out like I did last year, but uh, they did approve my press pass. It's only my second one. Ah, it's addictive. It is addictive. <laughs> you know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. It's time traveling. It's the way America it does feel like used to be and should continue to be. That it is, know? CPAC is like, I, it is like time travel. Yeah! Lady Maga, so you know, this is, uh, this is good, let me make sure my mic is on here. A lot of people are saying, we don't like LGBTQ, but you're yeah. here. Find me a quote from a conservative saying, we hate LGBTQ. I haven't heard that myself. <laughs> no, I've heard nothing. It's, thank you. This is my fourth year at CPAC. So people sort of say, it's not CPAC without Lady Maga. So I just, every 30 seconds, I have people who follow me, who know me, uh, who come up to me and share the love. Yeah. Um, and they appreciate what I do because drag is not intrinsically sexual or explicit or vulgar. It can be a lot of fun. Oh my God, so, say, say that again. Yeah, drag itself is not explicit, is, it's not explicitly vulgar or sexual. For me, it's just theatrical. I get to embody a totally different persona, work on the costume, bedazzle things, you know. My face is a, a palette that yeah. I get to paint this on, so it's, it's art for me. And I want to reclaim that in the world because Drag Queen Story Hour, Drag Queen's twerking in front of children, it's deplorable, it's absolutely well, unacceptable. Well, that's the thing, I mean, well, the difference is, you know, we shouldn't have LGBTQ people, you know, near, you know, you can't be open and in, within your identity in front of children. I mean, you're here, that's fine, but there's no kids around. You know, well, if you I've did this, to, if I've you did this, if you wanted to read a story to children, um, you know, I would, I would have a, you know, there'd be more of a problem with well, that. The thing if is, you wanted to, you know, teach at a school or something, and no, you if know, I were in the public school system, the children would never learn about my sexuality or my personal yeah, life. Yeah, you keep that like and, si uh, you keep that like separate. I do, of course. Yeah, you wouldn't dress like this in, at, in, school. at a school. No. Oh my God, no. That's our the only thing, thing. I've been to I've been to a lot of rallies where there's people of all ages there. I always am dressed like this, very tastefully. And so if people ever have questions, I just say, I'm, I'm wearing a costume. I could be Spider-Man or a unicorn tomorrow. We're not anti-LGBTQ. The media makes up this whole narrative. We just don't want you, you know, being in this identity, like in public in where there could library. be where there could be kids around. Well, I've been in public a lot of times at rallies and things in Utah. With like, and there's um, kids there and stuff? With, with people of all ages. Dress like I don't that approach and... them. I don't try to indoctrinate their children. And if people do want to take a picture with me, I always say, okay, mom and dad in the middle. Okay. I always keep a very professional distance. But okay. um, I would never go into a library or a public school. Thank you for that. No, thank you. No, absolutely. We just don't want, yeah, like absolutely. stay out of the library, stay out of the schools. The schools. And, stay, and, and like, stay out of children's programming. <laughs> What's, what's most important to you as a voter? I think the border has to be number one. Yeah, it is the number one. So Absolutely. We, um, we're actually looking for people that have a personal story about uh, the migrant crisis. Like, how has it personally affected you? Has anything happened in your life? No, I, I, I couldn't say. Um, you know, I could say that I used to be in a trade that was it's completely taken over by Hispanics now, not that that's necessarily a bad thing. What's up? Uh, what's know, on? I, uh, flooring. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like those subcontractor work. Exactly. Has mm -hmm. been... All right. And if you it... want to be a foreman in a big flooring shop, you need to speak Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> in in this area. In this area. Yeah. yeah. And it's driven the rate wages down. So that's probably as close as I have as a to a yeah. personal experience. Yeah. Immigration is destroying this country. Yeah. We're looking for. Uh, people that have personal stories on immigration, like how has the migrant crisis personally affected you? Well, in my community, the people that work at these restaurants and establishments, they do not speak the language and they do not assimilate. They are here for a job. They are not here to be Americans. How have you been personally affected by the migrant crisis? A couple times a week we have um, trucks coming through our neighborhood and and they ring the doorbell, you know, soliciting. Our neighborhood is not supposed to have solicitors, but they, they ring the doorbell and then, you know, 
you know, you see the big pickup truck with like eight people, eight men in it. Um, what are they soliciting know. for? I don't know. They sometimes they have a lawnmower, sometimes they don't. So they just they want to work. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And it's and it's. And this makes you. How does this make you feel? Well, like I'm being invaded, which we are. When yeah, they come up to your house. It's my and, personal space. You and they are. Have, uh, yeah. They have. Do they have a lawnmower or they have like a lawnmower? Right. Uh, no, like like whatever. It doesn't have like to be the gardening big one, equipment. Like, right. Sometimes. And stuff. Sometimes. And Sometimes they're, they're asking, roofers or whatever. And they want to work. Yeah. And they're well, like, no, but they, mm-hmm. are they like kind of pushy about it? I wouldn't say pushy because I'm not really the type of person that would tolerate that. Um, well, we know why you wouldn't tolerate yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. What I tell them is, you know, you're lucky that you came to my door rather than my neighbor's door, you know, because... You know, and you say, you know, he's ex secret service or he's a veteran, and you know, he doesn't take the doorbell ringing lightly. Because what I'm really saying to them is, you have disturbed my entire day, right? Yeah. Um, and soliciting is illegal per our HOA and per. Keep in mind, on my window, on next to my front door, I have a no soliciting sign. Okay. You know, yeah. but again, they don't speak our language. So, you know, and I'm not going to put it in Spanish. It's yeah. America. Yeah. What's one of the biggest issues you have as a voter going into the election? Illegal immigration. Okay. Illegal immigration, getting American jobs, and guess what? Americans will do anything for money. You take a, your usual Puerto Ricano. They'll do anything, darling. Just pay them in cash. Six bucks an hour. Do you have a personal story uh, about... Yes, I do. My daughter, she was raped by an illegal immigrant. She didn't even want to go to the police. I made her go. They did a sketch. Oh, spoke only Spanish and rough workman's hands. Uh, yeah, right. How do we know that he was, like, uh, undocumented? Okay, because when I took her to the police, when she didn't want to go, the okay. police woman yeah. said, definitely. Okay. And you know what she told me? The policewoman said, you go up and down the Rio Grande. There's bras and panties of girl. I was lucky to get her back, honestly. Probably a white slaver trade. How have you been personally affected by the migrant crisis? Like, do you have a personal story? Unfortunately, maybe for your audience, I don't. But I, I have a daughter and a second daughter who are going to be living in Manhattan. And I dread, you know something happening to them. I think that's where a more potential uh, problematic situation could occur. I think obviously in a lot of, you're hearing the urban horror stories. Uh, Trump has, I think, accurately labeled it migrant crime. It's a new category. Communism. It's communism. And they're even having law enforcement, illegal aliens as law enforcement. I mean, you, you can't cook up how insane this is, and yet there's, t- there's talk, there's musing of a Gavin Newsom for president candidacy. Are you saying that there's police officers that are undocumented? Absolutely. Wait, no, wait, where is uh, this? In Cali, in California, where my youngest daughter is in, in uh, uh, Santa Clara. The, in certain areas, they have, uh, maybe not completely. Actually, you know what, I think I heard about this. Um, it's one of those things, so anyone from my audience, Google, Forty uh, percent cops, and I think it's a. You see, like the statistics of how many of the police officers in LA are undocumented. I, I think say, it's like forty percent. I would cops. say don't Google it because you're going to get a false read. The cartels, they're smart. Mm-hmm. They operate. They it's. They realize that it's much more cost effective. Instead of just putting a backpack on a migrant, what they will do is they will take, you know, a white well presenting American citizen and have them go through ports of entry and get it through that because it's you know this is a business this is they're gonna get the most bang for their buck and that it's like what do you do with regards to that because at this point yeah you have you have you know fentanyl has become commonplace yeah absolutely fentanyl is a big problem in this country I live in Montgomery County so we see on the news that they're putting Narcans in schools and stuff like that to stop overdosing. But the cartels themselves, we need to designate them as a terrorist organization because the problem is all these people who are coming in, all these illegals, aliens who are coming in, they owe money to the cartels. 
and we have the deportation process, everything working. I think we need to put the United States needs to put a travel ban on Mexico until those cartels are destroyed, because well, that was the thing. I mean, so we just vetoed the immigration bill that was put forth by, you know, it was the Democrats and Republicans. You had Lankford, you had Kristen Cinema. Mm -hmm. Kristen Cinema. I mean, she's I wouldn't really call. Well, she's not a Democrat. She's an independent. Mm -hmm. But you know, at the end of the day, she's kind of like she rolls with us and it was vetoed mm -hmm. and you know I, I I had mixed feelings about that I mm -hmm. I part of me you know I don't it's a part of me that's like you know what I don't want Biden to solve it I yeah. I know it's a really big problem and I, I know it's gonna affect us immediately but mm -hmm. I kind of want to be able to I want to be able to run on this issue the Trump's not gonna have anything to run on mm -hmm. if this is solved even halfway so here's what he, here's what uh, here's what Trump can say. So Trump can actually advocate for the uh, for the travel ban on Mexico. Badly, the cheat goes because the illegals that are flowing in are being strategically brought in to potentially game the election. The migrant crisis, which is really a crisis by design of illegals being forcibly let in by the Biden cartel. You won't hear it from anyone but me. No other person except Charles Hurt has called it what it is. It's the Great Replacement theory. It's a great replacement theory, absolutely, and it's also an attempt by the powers that be to flood America with dependency, uh, creating a one-party rule. I mean, the southern border right now, it's like our replacement population is, this is the fall of Rome. It's like they've literally taken how Rome fell, and that's what they're implementing. It's a, the great replacement theory. Exactly. Yeah. Because because now they've imported yeah. millions and millions of people who know how to live without running water, electricity, and grocery stores. So when they collapse the dollar and the grid goes down and everything else because they're trying to run electric cars after they've shut down all the coal plants and everything else. Do you have a, a personal story about how the migrant crisis has affected you? Um, not so much. I'm retired now. I mean, again, I'm, I was a welder, power plant stuff. So, I mean, I was, I've never had a... I mean, in the, in the construction industry, they've pretty much taken it over, I will say. And if you look at the birth rate or the population increase, this is the highest increase in population we've ever had, and it is almost entirely due to immigration. It's been crazy with dealing with it in my county. We had a homeless shelter that, mm -hmm. you know, they were using it to house a few migrants. Mm -hmm. So we got the entire shelter shut down. Hmm, cool. And, yeah, and the... Uh, they were started, you know, we had the building evacuated and then they were like camping outside in tents because they had nowhere to like live. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had to get the police to come in and sort of, I don't know, tear gas them and get oh, them, there you go. Yeah, get, cool. yeah, and get them out of the county. It's cool. something else. Oh, yeah. that's one way to go about it. Yeah. And so, I mean, it was a win-win because it's like, I didn't want, we didn't want a, a homeless shelter in our county in the first place. Well, you know, we well some, I mean, you, you have to, some people that are going to, you know, whether they're veterans or whatever, who I mean, for, if, they're, if they're veterans, they, yeah, they, sure. they find themselves in a bad circumstance because, you know, they a lot of people come back from that kind of thing and they're not quite right and they don't quite fit yeah, back for into veterans. But I yeah, mean, otherwise, so, it's like, you know, I mean, so they're, they're, we're so, not a socialist country. Exactly. I mean, yeah, especially with these illegals, they don't have a place to stay, stick them on a boat back. My family owns property by the border. I'm not going to say uh, where. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we have people that I think are, uh, I mean, I think they're migrants. They came across yes. the property and, yes. you know, we shoot at them or we, okay. def we defend ourselves. Okay. Let's not say. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. so. Yeah. Um, because I'm, they're trespassing. Yeah, and I'm worried that if Biden gets reelected, mm -hmm. the Democrats are going to prosecute me for, for this. For defending yourself. Yeah. Like, I mean, because it's and like. Protecting yeah, it's like I, I can't say that I've never hit someone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, uh, right. Uh, you know, but it's, right. and yeah. Well, I think it depends on which state. And, of course, I know you're not going to say, but, you know, it, it depends. Um, you know, I'm, I think in Texas probably they would, you know, be fine with I, that. I, but give me, the, give me throw me a parade. <laughs> yeah, should, exactly, exactly. Do it from Texas. Not yeah. so much uh, California or New Mexico yeah. and, you know, who knows where Arizona is. So, yeah, I mean, the, so the moral of this story is, if you want to shoot at, you know, illegals on your property, do it in a red state. Yeah. I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> way so, to go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, that's where we're at right now. That's a, it's a mess right now with regards to freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Right. I had 
a family member that was thrown in jail for his political beliefs. Oh, believe me, they, I've, been, this, I've been hanging by a thread. I've had the FBI been to, yeah. he's been to my house twice. So, the, you know, the FBI came to his house. They confiscated his ice cream truck, all of his guns. Uh, they shut down his factory. All the kids that work there are com totally unemployed. And now his wife can't visit him in jail because she's not 18. Mm -hmm. you know? And now a lot of the J6, uh, there's several group organizations that have booths downstairs that are trying to help the J6 families with, you know, like coming into town for trials, hearings, and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I've been working with some of them because, like I say, I, I just thank God every day that Chris Cox had me inside the ellipse, you know, like at the White House. Oh, yeah. So when, so when, so when by the time I got out of there and got to the Capitol, everything was already over with. I mean, I marched around a little bit outside. There's a lot of suspicious stuff there. I had a lot of friends that were inside the Capitol, and, you know, they saw a lot of suspicious things going down when they were in Nancy Pelosi's office, when they were, you know, in, you know, going around the Capitol. And so this, there was a lot of shady people there that day. Oh, there were, and there were a lot of plants. I mean, like I said, you got the whole Ray Epps thing. I mean, they had info, FBI infiltrators. They confiscated his guns, his ice cream truck. And now that he's in jail, he, uh, his wife cannot visit because she's not 18. And they shut down his factory. Like, you have all these unemployed kids. It's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. And there's only, honestly, if things don't go the way I want it in 24, I've decided I'm leaving. I'm leaving America. Where would you go? Probably South America. Probably Argentina. We yeah. don't even have freedom of association. So, like, I have, you know, people, you know, people being jailed for their political beliefs. Yeah, or being debanked. Yeah. Thank, people yeah. are debanked, they're deplatformed, yeah, they lose their jobs. You, it, there are certain people in this country that if you take a picture with them and you post it, you will lose your job. My uh, uncle was jailed for his political beliefs. They took away his ice cream truck, confiscated his guns, you know, and now his wife can't visit him in jail because she's not 18. And this is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, the politicization, the politicization of the government is just a travesty. And these laws, it is all about selective enforcement. And it's like J6. There are laws on the book, and they're like, okay, let's take it to the fullest extent. Let's, let's really see what we can do. And on the flip side of the coin, it's like we have laws on the book, but, oh, you know, we can't deport these poor immigrants. They're, they're people just like us. And they're, they're just trying to get a good job. And, I'm totally done with it, but I will say, I respect the Democrats because they play to win. We do not play to win. We play to lose, and then we throw our hands up and say, oh. imagine if the roles were reversed. Rhinos. Huh? Too many rhinos. Yeah, we need to kick all of them out. Matt Gates is a real patriot, real American patriot. Met him multiple times. Um, great guy. Great I met him too. Yeah. He is. People think you're a pedophile. I don't think you're a pedophile at all. I don't think he's a pedophile at all. The charges against him are totally false. They're totally false. Oh my God. We love Matt Gates. Yeah, we do love Matt Gates. Very, very good man. It's just everything there is a mess. You know, with, you know, my daughter does beauty pageants. Okay. Great. Um, fine. And but now they've gone woke as well. There was another fourth grader that came in, and they were wearing. A, well, it was another fourth grade girl came in and. Uh, she was wearing a, a rainbow bikini. Okay, all right. Making a statement, I suppose. Yeah, and it was... A fourth grader. A fourth grader, a rainbow bikini, oh. of all things. And I was because like... Because they don't care. Yeah. They don't care who they hurt, uh, who they sacrifice. Yeah, and it was it was ridiculous. And, yes. the, you know, and they, people say, like, in her defense, like, oh, well, it's not hurting anyone. But it is because it distracted everyone. It distracted my daughter. When she was trying to do her dance routine, she nearly like fell off the pole, and it was it was disruptive. Absolutely, because it doesn't belong there, because it's inappropriate. My daughter, she does child beauty pageants. A recent pageant, my uh, some, one of the contestants, from the fourth grader, one of the girls, uh, was a boy. Well, no, she uh, wore a um, was it rainbow bikini to like the That's bathing obscene. suit competition. That's indecent. Yeah. That is horrifying. Yeah, the woke alphabet mafia wants us all to be debaucherous sluts. Distracted her from her dance routine. She almost of fell off the pole. It was 
it, you know, it was disruptive. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Look, Lady Maga stands for decency. Yeah. Lady and I'm Maga glad that people like, yeah. And your daughter, you know, just tell her that if someone's wearing a wig and makeup, they're still a man. You know, there's no such thing as a man becoming a woman. Yeah. You know. Thank you. They go through a lot of procedures, but there are two genders, no matter how much makeup you're wearing. <laughs> yeah, there's two genders, there's two pronouns, there's yes, two... exactly. Yeah. Daughter does uh, child beauty pageants. It's gone woke. You know, someone came into the pageant... Someone told me they have 14-year-old trans boys in girls. No, well, they had someone there that came in with the, the rainbow bikini for the bathing suit competition. Oh. And that okay. was... It was, like, distracting... Yeah. And like my uh, daughter, like almost like screwed up her dance routine. They nearly like fell off the pole that she was, and and it was like, oh my god. And it, it, I was like, this is why is this in this space? Yeah, right. You're making a political statement that has nothing to do with the competition. Right. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it's everywhere. It, it it permeates everything and is everywhere. And I don't know why can't we just let kids be kids? Let kids be kids. Yeah. And one of the things that the College of Commons of America is intending to do is create a better College of Commons that is more effective, more fiery, and more conservative than at any other point in our nation's history. Because right now, we need it more than ever. We look at what's happening in our country, all across our country, at how the left is taking over our institutions of power, how the left is taking over our universities, our schools, and the college Republicans are the number one way that we can strike back against that. Back in the day, college Republicans and young people who became Republican usually became that way through one specific method, through their parents. They were brought into it by their parents, by community members, by people that they personally knew. Nowadays, it's through the internet. Nowadays, young conservatives find their views, find their way of thinking through the internet, through social media, through the influence of current events. And college Republicans didn't adapt to that. Back in the day, the college Republicans were something that you could run like a model UN club. It was, you go there and discuss tax policy, discuss how we can improve our GDP, and it really stayed there. It didn't move on from there. Nowadays, the conservative movement and the Republican Party is more than just a discussion over specific tax policies. It's a cultural movement for the soul of this country. We are taking back this country. You want to talk about wokeness, I have literally lost debate rounds at state competitions because I'm white. I have been rallied against because I'm white, I'm a man, I'm a Christian, all of these things, I'm a Republican. Try telling a young person, especially a young woman, that you are conservative. It will be the end of the conversation. It will be the end of dating. Yes, like yes. I mean, if you have enough charisma and you dress well enough, maybe you get around it. but. There's only so much my suit can do before she's like, oh, you're a conservative. So yeah, this, this wokeness, this indoctrination, they're using our children against us. They're pulling the rug out from under us. We can't afford to live. And, and it's, it's a communist takeover. I mean, you have these, I'd say, communist companies like BlackRock and Zillow buying up all these properties yes. to raise property values. Now you can't buy a house in that area. Yes, I personally think that we should ban corporations or hedge funds or investment banks, large corporations, from owning single-family homes. I'm not necessarily opposed to wealthy people having multiple homes, especially if they're American citizens, but foreign nationals, foreign corporations, and corporations in America should not be allowed to buy up these houses. It's a decade-old private equity trick where you buy up all the local firms in your area, you buy up the family-owned businesses, you shut them all down, you consolidate them. They do this with hospitals as well. In fact, Rick Scott got rich off of doing this. He bought some hospitals, did a merger and acquisition, shut them down. Yeah, I, I, I try not to talk about Rick Scott, but yeah, he makes our side look really bad. You yeah, know, He's it, like a grifter. Exactly. That's something that sounds bipartisan, putting local laws in place so that you can't just, you know, buy up these properties. Yes, you know, yes. as a way to park your money, foreign or domestic. It's yes, yes. And it, it's the monopolization of real estate. Real estate is one of the largest, like, financial sectors. Most of the millionaires are real estate millionaires. Right, exactly, like Donald Trump. But Donald Trump built useful real estate. These corporations like BlackRock and Vanguard, they just buy up single-family homes, they consolidate it, and instead of being able to buy a house, you can only rent it. I know it's really, it costs a lot to buy a home now, but you can go on Jeff Bezos' new app, 
and you can for a hundred dollars you can own part of a home oh yes yes you will own nothing but you will be happy yeah you'll be on the happy yeah oh you're talking about world economic yeah, yeah, Forum. yeah, yeah, yeah. what do you think about joe biden's whole student loan debt forgiveness plan uh it's a total scam it's a total grift but you have to admire the uh, gumption of the biden administration because they ultimately do not care what the supreme court says they don't care what the Congress says or what the Senate says. They're going to do what they want. So you have to admire the fact that they play to win. Because ultimately, when student loan forgiveness gets blocked, it looks bad on us. Oh, you don't want to help out the, the rich trust fund kids or the kids that got into a liberal arts school and took out hundreds of thousands in debt. That's, that's ultimately what it is. It's paying off the voters. And if he does not pay off the voters, it looks bad on us because they're going to spin it as oh, you don't care about the common student, you don't care about kids, and that's not the case. What we need to do is decrease the cost of inflation, or decrease the cost of education. It's like a Reagan thing, where Reagan was the one who you know, killed you know, these state schools being free. My thought was reverse some of these Reagan-era policies. If state schools are free, then every other, you know, every other school has to compete with that because there's this free option. If you think about it, Reagan really did lead us on this path. He implemented a lot of liberal social policies. And, and if you want to have like a conservative economic policy, you have to have a socially conservative society. Wait, no, wait, well, wait, what was, wait, no. What liberal policy did he start? Amnesty, I mean, I... no-fault divorce. He was not very good on gun control and gun legislation. He was very free global trade, which hollowed out the interior of this country. And like I said, I'm from Kansas. Like, the only jobs out there are manufacturing, hard, like, hard labor. It's, it's wait, like Wait, wait, no workers. fault divorce. So that, isn't that like after 60 days or 90 days you can get a no fault divorce? Well, no fault divorce means that you can literally divorce someone for no reason. And it, is, it essentially removes all of the merit and all of the meaning behind having a marriage. Once you are married, you're supposed to be inseparable. Your two flesh become one. Marriage is supposed to be for the purpose of procreation and for a family. What is the incentive to get married? It's no, it's no different than dating dating someone, but having a piece of paper to say that you're dating them. If you are not comfortable with making a lifelong decision, don't get married. That is what marriage is for. Honestly, Reagan's like neoconservative libertarianism has started to hollow out this country. If you want economically conservative policies, you need a socially conservative people. And through socially conservative policies, we will engineer a- So, like, so it's socially conservative policy, like ending no-fault divorce? Yes. Ending- I'm Very, very um, pro-life. Uh, I'm fine with certain exceptions, you know, rape, incest, abuse. That makes up a marginal amount of cases. It's, it's one to 2%. I'm fine with conceding that on a case-by-case -case basis or danger to the mother, but ultimately we need to prioritize the lives of our children, the lives of our family, and the lives of our community members. We are not the world bank. We are not a. We are not an economic zone. No more money to Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, no more money to Israel. Yeah. I do not want to send aid to any country. Okay. We are not the world's police force. We have the Second Amendment. We have two oceans on either side. Canada is essentially docile, and we can build a border wall, and we would essentially be into, we, we would be impregnable. So you go to school, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's a college, so you said it's pretty liberal. Yeah. And you don't really get flack until what? Until we do our uh, chalking on the sidewalk. So uh, for those of you who don't know, chalking is where we essentially advertise for our club. So whenever we do that, we tend to have a lot of people that we'll see pouring water all over our stuff. And uh, we've had a lot of issues with people writing obscenities over the things that we write on the sidewalk. And then uh, facilities management has to come and power wash the sidewalks, which is not only a waste of their time and the school's money, but um, it's not a good look for anybody. So what's currently in the curriculum on your campus that you're like, all right, this is not education, it is, this is indoctrination. I don't really know if I can speak to that. So I'm an engineering student. Okay. So a lot of our stuff is science and math. Okay. And a lot of that's not, a, it's not up for debate. It's, it's pretty objective. You know, so I'm dealing with my daughter right now. Her school is trying to teach her consent. How old is she? I'm, that's a great question. How old should she be for her to learn about consent? What's an appropriate age for a child? I child? should be learning that stuff in school to begin with. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I understand there was a sexual ed class. I took one. But, I um, mean, that not, should be the limit of it, you know, just uh, 
one yeah. class and when you're a senior or something like that. Maybe a, a senior, yeah. 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 Maybe she should learn about it as a senior, mm -hmm. thank you. They're teaching my daughter about consent at her school. Consent, now. consent. For what, a tranny operation, what? If someone touches you, Oh, you can't do that. I don't consent to that. Oh, Jesus. Get a life. Yeah, Back in the 60s, I'll tell you what, we steamed up the windows of some beer with some <laughs> heavy neck, and my dear. I'm 72 years old. I can tell you all about I did consent. Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, <laughs> it was my choice to consent. <laughs> how old do you think a girl should be before she learns about consent? 30. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Oh my God. You know, but honestly, I wish I had been there because I would have popped that son of a bitch like a cockroach. Yeah. When did she learn about it? It's, uh, she was just like learning about it this year. She's 13 years old. Oh, see, I, I think that's wrong. My daughter, she, the school that she's at right now is trying to teach her consent. Consent. For consent. Cons like, yeah, consent. Like sexual consent. Yeah. At, yeah. at what age? Uh, that's well, a, actually, yeah, let me, honestly, you, so let me ask you. Let me ask you. What's matter. yeah? What's a, what's an appropriate age to teach uh, a I mean, person that, about that, consent? That's a good. That's a good point. I don't think the school has any business teaching that. I actually, when I was in high school, I debated in favor of comprehensive sex ed, but now we fast forward about uh, six, seven years later, and comprehensive sex ed has turned from oh, like you should wear a condom or or you should know birth control, which I don't believe in those things. But it's turned from that and a sort of social liberalism to teaching kids how to masturbate at, in sixth grade, you know, pardon my language, but these are the people doing it. These people are indoctrinating them into gender ideology, telling them to mutilate themselves. If a person says that they're suicidal, why would you give in to them? Mentally, ra mentally rational people do not think about taking their own lives. So it makes no sense to give into an irrational person's demands like we have done with gender ideology. What do you think is an appropriate age to teach your child about consent? Well, I would say that that's probably the parent's job, not the school. How old do you think a child should be before she learns about consent? Um, I, I think that that, like, consent for a sexual activity, they, why are they like, discussing that? Exactly. Maybe, maybe high school? Maybe like 15, 16 when, I don't know. That, but it definitely should not be in an elementary school, and that should be only a conversation between parents and their child. I'm the co-host of Steve Bannon's War Room, an investigative reporter, and I have my own clothing line. Oh, fantastic. Oh, my and God. My name is Natalie Winter. I'm, so, I'm sorry I no. did not recognize you. <laughs> it's okay. from my daughter's being taught consent. Consent. Like, uh, you know, sexual consent. Like, if I touch you and you say, oh, I don't consent to you touching me. Well, I would say consent is a is a good thing in the sense of you shouldn't judge people if they don't want to be touched. Well, what's a good age to teach a child that? Yes. Well, I think what you bring up really goes back to this long march through the institutions that is really designed to, at the crux of it, destroy the nuclear family, right? And the way they do that is by pushing these very, very, I would say, just it's not even woke and weaponized. Truly, I think honestly satanic. I think we're in a spiritual war and I think they, they push these just very anti-nuclear family, anti-Christian, anti-Western civilization values that if we just renege on those and we reject those, we're not going to have a country much longer. But that's precisely the point, obviously. Just look at what's going on at the southern border. These people don't believe in borders. You'd want to think that they should be somewhere around the age of consent before we start talking about it. Yeah. I'm going to assume it's a little younger than that. or Like 13 or something. Yeah, that's a little too early to be having even remotely sexual discussions. My daughter, they're teaching her about consent. Yeah. <laughs> How old is she? Can I? I mean, that's a good question. How old do you think she should be before she learns about consent? What age? I would think a teenager at least. Yeah, I was going to say it's 15, 15 16. 16. Yeah. yeah. 15, 16. I think. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, she's 14. But like... That's still young. Coming from? Puerto Rico. Really? Yeah. Oh, my God. So you're, you're Puerto Rican? No. Born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Where you live in Puerto Rico? Uh, Isla Verde. Okay. Fantastic. Which is a great beach. Um, 
You live on the beach. That's amazing. I live, yeah, I have an ocean outside me, and I swim in it. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I say. What's it like in Puerto Rico now? Inflation is kicking our butts. The Biden inflation is kicking our butts. And my husband and I are better off than most folks. But I have to tell you the truth that some of my friends, I'm helping them to eat now. To eat? To uh, buy groceries, to eat. Yeah. Because all God's children need to eat. I, that, I, can, I can understand that. Yeah, so it, it's you know, a, everyone, everyone should get food. Everyone should get Everyone food. should have access to food, housing, health care. Yes. All that, nah, don't give me that Obamacare. Uh-uh, no, no, no. All right, yeah. Well, I'm on Medicare because I'm an old, crusty old broad. You say Medicare, but, I mean, yeah, because you're, you're right. You don't want the government taking over Medicare. Oh. Can you imagine if the government, like, just took over Medicare? It needs nah. to stay within the free market. And, and I, we have a good plan, a supplement plan as well. I'm like insured up the wazoo. My husband's a, a specialist in insurance, and he made sure. I've now applied that to the January Sixers because they obstructed an official proceeding at Congress. So it's quite a stretch. Um, over 300 January Sixers were charged with that, including President Trump was charged with 1512C2. Once that happens, I think that's going to crumble a lot of the cases and some of the people that have had that as their most serious charge will now only have trespassing, remaining in an unrestricted building, and those types yeah, of things. And then, no, then all of those people will now uh, hopefully be free to walk the streets. That would be the, the hope. And uh, it, it, it really comes down oh. to our Department of Justice, you know, really starting to be the Department of Justice for all. But I thought we wanted to get rid of the Department of Justice. Well, I think that we need a lot of work in a lot of those organizations. So, so you're a reformer. Yeah. We're reforming the Department of Justice. We're reforming the FBI. We're not getting think, rid of them entirely. I, I think reform is, is the first place. I mean, it comes from awareness. And one of the things that happened that, that we give credit to the January Sixers is we got an inside view of what the Department of Corrections is like and how people... You and I, if we fell into the Department of Corrections for any any wrongdoing. You know, it's funny. You talk about the criminal justice system, and I, I feel kind of sheepish talking about it because I've spent so many years making fun of all of these leftists, these Black Lives Matter people, whenever they talk about the criminal justice system. And now that I want to talk about it, I'm, I feel a little bit like, ah, uh, I'm kind of embarrassed, really. After being like, you know, oh, back the blue, there's like this sort of embarrassment, right? But the good side of that is that they've been fighting this fight for a long, long time, and it shows that people on both sides of the aisle can come together. Yeah, that's a great thing. What would that be? What would that look like for both sides of the aisle? Black Lives Matter, Antifa, you know, protesters saying, hey, the criminal justice system is corrupt. It can't be reformed. This needs to be, you know, rebuilt from the ground up. And then someone, someone like yourself, who's on, you know, the right, you know, who is MAGA, America First. What would that look like? Well, for instance, Trump's First Step Act was a, was a great step in the right direction to reduce um, sentences that were were over the top. So, so that's that's one area that that it can happen. We've got to recognize that the United States has the highest incarceration rate in the entire world. It's a hypercarceral them in these liberal cities. They got rid of bail reform. I get confused sometimes trying to keep up. We like bail reform. We don't like bail reform. You know, this I feel a bit of a dissonance. Well, I think the most important thing is that what you're doing right here, citizen journalism, getting the information out there, getting the public to be aware, to to recognize what's going on. That's the first step. We've got to see it. Once you see it, it can't be unseen. So you are, you are, Amer there's America first and there's Maui first. Yeah, I'm Maui first. <laughs> what are some issues that uh, that they care about, that the Hawaiian voters care about? Well, a lot of the Hawaiians still want to become a free kingdom. So they want to go back to the original Hawaiian kingdom. And that's an another dynamic that plays into it because we're li re really living in a different culture there. So I like to be respectful as, as much as I can of their original culture and the fact that they would prefer to be outside of the United States. So yeah. there's a, that also creates an issue because they don't like to vote based oh, wow. on that because they would prefer to have their own kingdom back. They want to get their land, they want their land back. Yeah, well, their land's been stolen and it's still being stolen and Lahaina's not looking good Ooh. for that at the moment yeah, either. Yeah, that is, that is something with regards to, you know, the indigenous population and 
That's a whole. Th how do you, how do you feel about that? We don't really talk about that as America first. It, I don't know how to talk about that. Well, that's why we have to put Hawaiians first. They deserve to be put first. I mean, it was their state, you know, it was their country, it was their kingdom before we took it over. So uh, we are occupying their state or their kingdom. So they do deserve to be put first. They deserve rights and they do deserve to, to keep their land and maintain their land instead of, uh, you know, having just the Westerners or the government just taking it from them. Wow. That's a hot take. I, I wow, I appreciate that. Thank it's, you. I mean, it's it's the harsh truth, though. I mean, you, this happened, you know, in the in the late fifties. We could have we could have prevented this. We already knew how bad this turns out when we took it from the Native Americans from all the you know other states and put them on reservations. We've already gone through this story, and then they just repeated it again. It's a good thing. So, right now. Taylor Swift, she's not our favorite person. Who are we gonna use to target Gen Z to compete with Taylor Swift? Well, you're gonna have to find probably some high profile person in pop culture, maybe someone like The Rock or Shaq. I don't think these guys are gonna speak out, but I know that they're probably on the right side of the transom, both of those guys. Shaq is the most iconic guy on the planet right now. If there was some way that Shaq would come out and endorse Trump, he has in a very soft way done that. He said, listen, I don't always agree with how he words things, but his, his heart and, and on issues, he's in the right place. That's as close to an endorsement from Shaquille O'Neal as you can get. Been in the contemporary Christian genre. I have six albums. We did a patriotic album, and then we veered and did a Trump one that went number one last year. And the president number one where? I, I kicked Taylor Swift out of number one on iTunes. The amount of people that bought your music eclipsed Correct. Taylor Swift. And then, and then um, Billboard is the world um, calculation for buying music, and it, it hit the pop and country charts for a month as number two. It went yeah. platinum. We gave an award to President Trump back in November. And That's funny because it's um, a lot of a lot of uh, conservative artists have been hitting that specific category. Yes, right? I was and one it, of the ones that started can't. that off last year. So Taylor Swift, she's either a Democratic psyop or a you know, you know member of the CCP, <laughs> right, right? right? And she's being used to target you know Gen Z voters. Uh, who do we have on our side that's going to target the Gen Z vote? I mean, when it's when it comes to politicians, Vivek Ramaswamy has done a very good job. When we're mm -hmm. talking about political or, or rather cultural figures, I would say people like the Nelk Boys. You know, these kind of these kind of guys that are tired of being rallied against. And in the cultural space, it really is only them. But we need more. We need more people like. Uh, for example, Harrison Butker, I'm from Kansas, so Harrison Butker, he is a noted Catholic, and he said that the key to his success in life has been God, family, people like that. We need athletes like that. Eddie Garcia, currently running for the U.S. Senate in Virginia, he is very pro-school choice. Um, and in fact, he wants to pass legislation so that parents or households um, basically get the same amount of money and tax credits that they would get with their student going to a public school. If you're paying twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year for private school, Absolutely. you get uh, you know a yes. voucher for that and yes. they, they pay they pay part of that freight. Absolutely. Per head, like say there's like a you know a thousand students, then the government you know designates fifteen thousand dollars per student. Right. And instead of it going to the local public school it right. goes it towards out, a charter school. school, you know, which is and private or enterprise. Home school, yes, and or homeschool, parochial school. Yeah. And a lot know. of it's a very, you know, it's an uphill battle in some ways because you, I'm trying to talk to parents and because they think when they think school choice, they think someone from a lower income area can come to my area and send their kids to school. But that's, that's not how not it works. what we're no. talking about no. at all. No, no, it has nothing to do with that. They will stay in their area. They can fix their... That. Okay. But think about it. School choice. And you get of a voucher course, to go course. wherever you want. Right. And it's okay, so they the, think, the broadness okay. of its appeal is sometimes works against it. Yes. 
in, you know what I mean? Because especially in an area where you're paying 20000 a year in property taxes. It would also benefit the kids that do stay in public schools because they would have smaller classrooms. Yes, much smaller. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah. But it's like, but those stay people like will stay in their district. Yes. You will have your district. It's not yeah, because it's not, it, it yeah. I don't want it to sound like a liberal policy. Anytime the word choice is mentioned, it's mostly conservative other than the female issue, right? Okay. Other than that, um, we like choice. For example, national right to work, right? That's a choice, yeah. right? Not having to join a union automatically yeah. and, you know, this be subjected to paying their dues so yeah. um but yeah when there's choice actually because we want less government not more yeah. we want the individual to make decisions for themselves gold although you know uh, pretty pretty good numbers coming out of uh, bobby kennedy jr uh certainly within the democrat party we're talking about rfk jr yeah RFK right Jr. Now. i've been to his things and i don't, most of the people I see there are not people that vote Democrat. I originally liked him because I thought, oh, well, he's going to sort of split the vote for the Democratic Party. But he's not really splitting, uh, take peeling off people there. Most of the people there don't, you know, they, they align with us. You know, they don't believe in climate change. Do you think uh, uh, if, if we get to the general election and we get uh, RFK Jr., that it would potentially severely hurt Trump? The people, though, that go to those things, they didn't take the vaccine, da, 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 so, and it's generally skews conservative. A lot of people that just, in the end of the day, would just vote for Trump, I think. So I don't well, I think the more candidates you have, and like Marianne Williamson, RFK Jr., and some of these other... Marianne Williamson would peel off votes. Yeah, I, I think the more candidates you have in, the better it is for Trump. I think that's just simply going to be the case. One petition that elaborates on his bill and lists a whole series of reasons why we need to defund the United Nations. Okay, just okay. So just go. Let's go over the re reasons. Sort of ignoring highlights. mass rapes of Israeli women. Yeah. So let's start uh, hiding the problem of wait the problem of female abusers. What's that? Correct. So we know from hundreds of studies, women are just as likely to be abusers, domestic abusers, as men are. What's the name of your organization? So it's the Coalition to End Domestic Violence, and uh, we have we are focused both in the United States and internationally. Oh, okay. So you want to end domestic violence? That's that's where we started okay. on this journey. Okay, that's this where journey. you started. Yes. You want to end domestic violence. You want the inclusion of female abusers. How many of the abusers are you know, the female, the woman in the it's, relationship? It's basically 50-50. Uh, you may have heard just last week in Pennsylvania, there was a female judge who took out her gun and shot her ex-boyfriend in the head. Some studies have shown it's actually women have the edge in terms of numbers of instigating domestic violence. According to the Centers for Disease Control, women are more likely to be the perpetrators of psychological... Do control. we trust the CDC, though? I think in this area, I, I, I understand your concern and point. This is actually a well-developed study that's, that's recognized as being... Uh, scientifically valid. We're trying to influence the policies and or what policies and would you like to see? So, for example, let's start at the with the, the federal law. It's called the Violence Against Women Act. Obviously, that's a pretty biased law. This is like a men's rights organization. I would say it's not men's rights because if you care about women who are have abusive tendencies, would you want them to see get help, get counseling before the the abuse flares up and turns into a, a judge shooting her ex-boyfriend in the head. Not a men's rights organization. Not a men's rights organization. And not a men's, you're, not a, you're not a what they call like a MRA. A, you're not a men's rights activist. Yeah, no, we're not MRA. Not totally, that's, that's uh, not what this is at all. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. About an hour ago, a, a gentleman came to this booth right here and he said that he had been repeatedly slapped by his mother. Oh my God. And then he said, but oh, that didn't really count. That tells the whole story right there. He was physically abused by his mother, but it didn't count because he was a male. I always say that the, the left thinks there's a lot of amendments written in invisible ink that we can't see. Like what, but, which one? That you have the right to an abortion, that there's a, that there's a concrete separation of church and state. All of those things are things that they make up. That's another thing, church and state. Where in the, cons where in the amendments in the Constitution? It's like, not. It it's not, sense. yeah. No. There's establishment yeah. clause. Right. But, but beyond, the, beyond but that. But beyond the establishment clause, there's, there's nothing. nothing. No. 
It does not say that the church cannot vote, cannot have a voice, that religion can't have influence. Those are your citizens. But separation in church and state is a letter Jefferson wrote to a church and said, don't worry, the government is not going to oppress you or interfere with you. It was, a, it was an assurance to the church they would be free. And it's contradicted in nearly every other piece of documentation. Yes. We have under God in our, in our money, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean a specific... Well, that, was, that, was pro, that was from um, that McCarthy. And that's oh, not under God. God. I meant... Uh, so the pluribus God. unum yeah. was yeah. like under, from many one, right. and then it was, that was... Yeah. McCarthy changed it. God we trust. Yeah. yeah. But McCarthy's not a, I don't, I mean, he's not a great uh, yeah, person for our side. It's kind of an embarrassment. It's a-